Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm glad you all are here, whether you're here with us in person or joining us online um, through our ever-increasing options to, to access that. I hope the sound is working better today online, but we'll find out. Um, let us know if it's not, and we'll do the best we can. Just uh, one uh, set of announcements this morning that I have. Um, we have some school supplies to bless later, and then we have um, a couple different options for um, uh, our education hour immediately following worship. Um, singers um, are invited to meet uh, with Dr. Alice around the piano again immediately following worship. Um, elementary school kids should head for the fellowship hall, which is on your left on the way out. Um, teenagers, uh, middle and high school youth should stay in the gathering space out here and look for Sister Jenny. Um, and um, adults will be all the way down at the far end of the education wing. Uh, we'll be continuing our study on Genesis. That's all the announcements I have today. I um, invite you to stand as you are able, and we'll begin with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth and free us from our sin, gracious God. And we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love of our neighbors as ourselves. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God made you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. We begin worship with hymn number 688, Lord of Light.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of the best of joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated for our meetings. Amos was a herdsman by profession and a prophet by God's call. During a time of great prosperity in the northern kingdom of Israel, the prophet speaks to the wealthy upper class. He warns his listeners that fulfilling God's demand for justice brings blessing, while corruption and oppression incur God's wrath. Our first lesson this morning is from Amos chapter 5. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, uh, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. We cannot hide our thoughts, desires, and actions from God to whom we are completely accountable. Nevertheless, Jesus understands our human weakness and temptations because he also experienced them. Therefore, we can approach the throne of grace to receive divine mercy from Christ. Our second lesson this morning is from Hebrews chapter 12. Indeed, the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For our children's moment this morning, we only have one of our youngest worshipers in here. Uh, and I heard a rumor that someone missed his morning meds this morning, so I'm going to give him an active children's sermon this morning. All right, buddy, I want you to come on up to the school supplies up here and just, just sit by them for a second. Um, so many of you remember that um, at the beginning of school we were gathering some school supplies. We've been collecting other school supplies that have rolled in. And you'll see up here, if you look, if you can see over, um, we've got all kinds of color up here, pens and pencils and folders, um, uh, some reams of paper, which apparently, um, maybe it's no surprise if you've ever been near a school, they go through a lot of paper. Um, so I'm going to ask, and Allie, if you come and sit by the other side. From, no, I don't want you guys to go there right now. Nope. Not even in the worship place. Allie, this side. Allie, this side. Towards me. There we go. Sit there. Oh, look, up, what a picture that makes, too. I hope somebody has a camera. So um, you have them in a calm moment together. Um, so we're going to bless these school supplies and send them to our, um, send them to our um, community partners over at James East. So, Hill, if you would reach out and find something to put your hand on. And Allie, if you would reach out and find something to put your hand on. And then we're going to, you guys can close your eyes and we're going to say a blessing over these things. God, we give you thanks for the many gifts you give to us and the ability to pass those gifts on to others. We give you thanks for the abundance that you share with us, that we may share some of it with others. We pray that these, that these items would be a blessing, that they would be multiplied with many other donations and gifts so that the kids um, at Jenks East and in all of our schools would have the things that they need um, to be in a safe and healthy learning environment and have everything they need at their fingertips when they need them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Please stand for a gospel verse. Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. 
Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. The Gospel of the Lord. Yay. <laughs> what? <laughs> what on earth? I, I've heard uh, a lot of preaching on this text and a couple others like it in the Gospels. And typically it turns into an exercise in trying to get out of what whatever was just said. My favorite silly example of this is that bit about the, the eye of the needle and the camel. And I've heard some really tortured explanations where like, well, see, like the, the city had gates, right, where the camels would come in. And there was like one gate that everybody knew was like the really hard gate to get to. That was called the needle gate. What? No. If there ever was such a thing, nobody ever wrote it down. And, and if it was, if the, the entire idea around that is anachronistic. Because we're, we're straining at this to try to, oh, how can we take it and make it somewhat more reasonable? Because the kid, the, the young man, but let's be honest, when you say young man, it's because you're talking about someone we could, would consider a kid, someone younger than me at least. Maybe just a little bit of beard. He has a reasonable question. And he's polite about it, too. There's no reason to think he's not being polite when he says, good teacher. The kid's got manners. And Jesus, he does this occasionally, but not real often, throws that back in his face and says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God Alone. Now, if the disciples up to this point had gotten anything of what Jesus had been saying, they might have said, but Jesus, we thought, shut up, you. Not right now. Nothing, nothing else out of the peanut gallery. Not right now. And then, and then he says, you know the commandments. He doesn't even wait for the kid to answer. And he starts rattling off the commandments. And if you know your ten commandments, you'll know that's a very good list of the commandments that affect not our relationship with, our, with God, but our relationship with one another. You shall not murder or steal or commit adultery. Honor your parents. Don't bear false witness. And then he slips one in there when you're not looking. You shall not defraud, which helps point us to where, where this whole thing is going. But the young man dutifully responds, I've kept all of these. And then it says that Jesus looked at him with love. And again, there is no reason to doubt Jesus' sincerity or Mark's description of Jesus sincerely, his heart breaking for this young man. The word love does not actually come up very often in Mark's gospel. Jesus doesn't go around loving people. He doesn't. And, and this, this this kid, I keep calling him a kid, he says, I've kept all these things since my youth. Well, how long has that been, really? He looks at him, a total stranger, with love, and says, you lack 
one thing. Only one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But, 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 but I have many possessions. And this is where we start to try to get out of the implications of what's been said. Well, Jesus was just talking to this one young man. That was the one thing that he lacked. Maybe the rest of us, there's one thing that the rest of us lack. And then Jesus goes on. How hard it will be for those to have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples go, huh? What? You see, in those days, as I think in many ways in our days, wealth and prosperity were a sign that you were blessed, that God was on your side, that God is, God is behind you in whatever you're doing, and so that earthly and worldly success is a sign that you are, you are, you are blessed. I mean, the entire churches have built themselves around this encouraging this, right? But he goes on and he says this bit about the camel and the eye of a needle, you know. How's that going to work? And at this it says they were greatly astounded. The word there is shocked or even th this made, it made them crazy to hear this. They were, they were mad, not, not angry mad, but mad like, what? How can you say something like that? They don't say, well, you know, we'll be fine, because like, you know, we're definitely not wealthy, Jesus. No, they say, then who can be saved? They've been assuming up to this point that there's a whole bunch of people ahead of them in line, because that's how, they, that's how things work, they understand. And then we start to try to put ourselves into this, right? And, and that's where the, the, the looking for more exceptions to this goes. Um, I, I read recently there was a preacher who once said, everybody wants to read the Bible literally, except that verse in Mark 10 about the camel and the eye of a needle. And this preacher says, that's the only verse in the whole Bible that's meant to be taken literally. And then this congregation chuckled nervously. <laughs> And then, and then we think, well, well, the rich and the wealthy, that's, that's not me. Because all of us can think of someone who is wealthier than us, unless um, you're a tech billionaire with a uh, rocket or a space plane, right? And even they can, after they've bought the rocket or the space plane, they can now think of somebody who's richer and better off than them, right? There's always somebody higher on the Forbes list, and I'm... I'm I haven't looked in a while, but I don't think there's anyone in the room here or who's been tuning in who's on the Forbes list, right? No. We can always find, we can always point the finger somewhere else and say someone else has more than, I'm not, I'm not really that rich. Uh, someone posted an article on social media this morning. I've seen a lot of articles like it lately. And the, the article was a news article saying um, there's shortages on grocery shelves. Um, you know, the, the big uh, Sam's Club and Costco, they're limiting your, they're back to limiting your toilet paper purchases and your paper towels. Uh, but this was also talking about how in grocery stores, there's entire lines of items that, you know, this spice manufacturer can't get the right jars for one of their lines. And these guys are having trouble for the cardboard for their pre-baked pot pies. So the list goes on and on. And they are estimating that, that before the pandemic, that... The, the shelves at any given time were missing like 8% of what should be there. And now that in a lot of places that's double. There's, it's 15, 20% of items that you'd be looking for can't be found. Doesn't that say something about our sense of abundance and our sense of prosperity that, that it's a panic when we can't find toilet paper, right? That it's, it's an emergency when we can't have those spices we have to use. those. We are used to walking into supermarkets and the shelves are literally full. That is our sense of what's normal. 
and for there to be gaps on the shelves where we're not using them, it's like a violation of our birthright as Americans, right? That's the kind, that's the kind of abundance and prosperity that I'm saying we take for granted. And so, if you don't believe Jesus, listen to Amos in the first reading. He's not directing his critique at just a handful of people, but an entire upper strata of a society that has taken things for granted, that has taken their abundance for granted, that has taken people for granted. And you notice that Jesus doesn't say, go and sell all that you have and give it to the church, which obviously that would be anachronistic. Uh, but he doesn't say, he says, he doesn't say give it to us, he says give it to the poor. Give it to those who have less than you. But Jesus, they might waste it. That's how they got poor, isn't it? I mean, that's, that is a narrative we have, right? That the poor have done something to deserve. And if we did too much to help them, it would be just wasted on them. Because we use our money so much better those of us who don't consider ourselves poor. And we're still looking for a way out of this. We're just gonna, we're gonna keep digging into this until we can find, I know, I know. When Jesus says, get rid of all your stuff, he doesn't really mean like, like get rid of it, get rid of it, right? He means to cultivate a sense of inward detachment from your possessions, right? Sort of zen out. I still have the stuff, but it doesn't mean that much to me. So here's a little test. I'll, I'll just go ahead and take some of your stuff because you're inwardly detached from it. You're not going to miss it, right? Right? No? Everywhere we turn in this text, we find ourselves trapped. Even the promise at the end to his disciples, I tell you that no one who has left any of these things behind, not your family, not your home, not your fields. Back in those days, everyone had some kind of fields. I don't care what you left behind. You're going to receive more back. Not just more back. You're going to receive a hundredfold back. Jesus, I'm still waiting for my hundredfold back. And then he says, with persecutions. Oh. Oh. Is it like a... Is it like a discount plan we can buy into Jesus? Like, not, I don't want a hundredfold back. Maybe if I just give some... No? Not how that works, is it? Everywhere we turn in this text, we're trapped. Who then can be saved? Not, oh, I can manage this. Or we can work something out. Let's make a deal. Maybe if I just give some to the church, that will get God off my back. If you want to give it a try, right? You know, church has been doing that for 2,000 years. And that just relocates the problem. What are we to do with this? Jesus looked at them those who had left everything behind and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Notice he didn't say, ha ha, only kidding, you don't have to sell all your things. That was just for that one guy. Or, you know, relax, God's in charge. God's got this for you. You go back to doing whatever you're doing. That is not what Jesus says. What Jesus says is that for human beings, it is impossible. You can't do it. You can't make a deal. You can't cut your losses. You can't work out a discount payment plan. There's not, God's not going to take this on installments. Simply for God... All things are possible, even, even when it's people and their possessions. <laughs> That's the hard case. For God, all things are possible. God will even be able to part us from our possessions if that's what God needs. And God will 
be able to overcome our narratives about the deserving poor and some of our possessions might in the hands, end up in the hands of people who we would label as totally undeserving. And for God, for God, there is no size limit to the eye of the needle or the size of the camel. For God, all things are possible. God can even work with you. God can even work with me. God can work with us whether or not we've cultivated a state of inward detachment from our stuff. God will be able to work with us even if we haven't sold our possessions and given the poor. God will definitely be able to find a way to work with us if we have. God will even be able to take care of us if we accidentally take the wrong part of scripture literally. God will find a way to take care of us, even if we sell too many of our possessions and give them to too many people we don't think deserve it. Because for God, all things are possible. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of the day is hymn number 685, Take My Life That I May Be. together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in his burial. He descended to the dead. Made children and heirs of God's promise. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Uniting God, you call forth different gifts in those who follow you. Encourage us to welcome the diverse benefits and blessings of the whole church in teaching, preaching, 
prophecy, healing, and more. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Nurturing God, you bring forth crops from the soil and bounty from the trees. Increase the produce of the land and bless all who toil in fields and orchards. Provide for good working conditions and keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Empowering God, you offer compassion for those who are overlooked or forgotten. Open the hearts of local, national, and world leaders to show such compassion and love for their neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sheltering God, in Jesus you traveled among us without a place to lay your head. Provide self, safe places to sleep and rest for those who have no place to live. Sustain ministries that offer food, clothing, and peace of mind, including family promise and nightlight Tulsa. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renewing God, you bring life out of death. Help us part with those things that are no longer beneficial to us and open our hearts to see where new life is budding in this congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we thank you for the lives of those who have died. Make us confident in your promise of salvation and support us in our own journey of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers of God and those in our hearts known only to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Share that peace with those around. Morning. 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 Morning, everyone. Good. How are you? So as all the choirs are angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and enjoy your unending heaven. Suffering, who preached good news to the poor and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, 
He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ has risen. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord. Unite the wills of all who share this heaven with you, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in the kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come.
May these gifts of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in this body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith to a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. We send us forth with, from worship with hymn number 705, God of grace and God of glory.